Let's continue to stand as we sing our call to worship. Rise up, O Church of God.
things you need to understand with next Sunday's meal is also a housewarming for Pastor Alex Crystal Jackson. So uh, if you have any card gifts, cash that you'd like to give to them for housewarming, feel free to do that. They'd be appreciative. And we're combining that with our typical uh, first Sunday meal. Okay, so look forward to that. Let's continue to worship using uh, the hymn, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus.
morning, we're going to go back to James chapter 2. Today in James chapter 2, we're going to continue James' defense of a statement he made earlier in the chapter. He made the claim, faith without works is dead. Over the past few weeks, we've looked at the text where he first made his claim and has since defended that claim and given even a counter-argument as a response to further fortify his statement when he responded to it. Today, James continues his response to that objection. Someone may say, you have faith and I have works. And said faith without works is dead. But someone may argue, oh no, you, know, you have faith, I have works. We can have one or the other. To say that you have faith without works, can that faith save you? Even the demons believe God exists, they believe that there is one God. They believe that God is one. The demons believe that, though, and shudder. Knowledge of the existence of God is not enough. James is making that case here. We saw last week that the demons know that God exists. They not only know that he exists, they know the scriptures. They know they are rebellion against him. We saw from various texts last week as well, they even know that Jesus is the Son of God. And they know that their time is limited. These are all things the demons know. There's so much knowledge that they have. But knowledge is not enough. We are saved by grace through faith. But that faith will manifest itself in a changed life. James has been making this point, and he is not alone. We've looked at the words of, of the author of Hebrews, when it said, And without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, and that he rewards those who seek him. We must believe in God. We must have a life lives in light of that belief. Jesus himself said, you will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can the diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Even Paul, even Paul, who people try to say disagrees with James, they are wrong. Paul does teach that we are saved by grace through faith and not a result of works. But it is not as if Paul disagrees with James' statements. Paul tells us, for we walk by faith and not by sight. The way we walk, what we do, is a result of our faith. In 12.1 of Romans, Paul says, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is a reasonable service. Because of Romans 1 through 11, because of the truths of who God is, of who man is, of what Jesus has done, because of the faith that we have in him, because of our sinfulness, because of Jesus, because we're a new creation, because we've been saved by faith, therefore live this way. This is what we're called to. Works will not save you. But if you live a life contrary to what you've been called to, if you claim faith in Christ,
Christ, but there is no fruit of that faith in your life, what good is it? Can that faith save you? Even the demons believe and shudder. Do not move past these verses too quickly. There will be many who will have sat in churches week after week, who have fooled themselves into thinking they are somehow the exception to this text. They will say with their mouths that they believe there is a God, but there is no fruit. There are many who will say, Lord, Lord, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. In our text today, James is going to move to the example of Abraham. We've been in the book of James for a few months now. We began James 1 1 in late May, and week after week, text after text, we've seen James continually back up his statements with examples. With illustrations. These have helped strengthen his arguments and make them easier to understand. When you ask God, do so without doubting, otherwise you are like a wave tossed by the wind. The rich should not boast in their riches, they should boast in their humiliation. They are like a flower of the grass who will soon be scorched by the sun and wither away. Your temptation, you must flee from it, because just as the birth narrative is, your temptation is giving birth, uh, it's like giving birth. Temptation, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin. Sin, when it grows, leads to death. Be a doer of the word and not a hearer only, or you are like a man who looks at his face in the mirror. But when he turns away, he forgets what he looks at. Like. You believe God exists? Even the demons do that as well. Again and again, James will give us a word picture, an illustration to help fortify his argument. James is not the only one who does this in Scripture. Paul does this as well. Paul tells us he has fought the good fight. He has run the race. Paul tells us that we are the body of Christ. We are all members of the body, which does not consist of only one member, but of many. The foot should not say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. If the body, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? These words, these illustrations help us understand the point he is making. Paul tells us, has the potter, he tells us about the potter and the clay. What will the molder say? So will, will what is molded say to the molder, why have you made me like this? Jesus himself used illustrations such as these often as well. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. I will make you fishers of men. When Jesus often, often asked questions, he would often respond to parables and stories. The Gospel of Luke tells us one Sabbath, when he went to dine the house of the ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy, and Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? They remained silent. He took him and he healed him and sent him away. And they said to him, Which one of you, having a son or an ox who has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. 
to use the illustration of the son and the offering. They'll prove his point. When a lawyer asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus could have simply told him, everyone's your neighbor. Those close to you, your acquaintances, people you don't know, even people you don't like, they are your neighbor. He could have said that. But instead of simply telling him the answer, he told him the parable of the Good Samaritan. And then after the Good Samaritan, talking about the priest and the Levite and the Samaritan came across the man. He asked, which of these three do you think proved a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? The man answered, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus used this example not only to tell him the answer, but to help show him the answer. In our text today, we're going to see an example from Scripture that James is going to use to help further his point. James has been laying out a case that faith without works is dead. More specifically, in the past couple of weeks, he has been combating the objection that some may say, well, I have faith and you have works. James now turns us to the illustration. Uh, this illustration that further strengthens his argument from James 2, verses 20 to 24. Scripture says, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that said, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. We see the example of Abraham. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. He was called a friend of God. James makes the case that here, Abraham's example displays the truth that we are justified, not by faith alone, but by faith displayed in works. Who was Abraham? Abraham was the first Hebrew patriarch. He's a major figure throughout Scripture. We read of him in Genesis, and then the scripture refers to him time and time again throughout the Bible. He is one of the major figures of our faith, as well as a major figure in Judaism, and even Islam tries to claim Abraham as well. Abraham, first known as Abram, was from Ur, the Chaldean. God in Genesis 12 tells him. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will dishonor, and, and, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. They are already old. He tells us. He takes his wife, he takes Lot, and they go. Things were not always easy, but he went. As an act of faith in God, a cult, God promises him good things. Promises him blessing. Promises a great <laughs> people from him. Promises he will have a son. That his posterity will be so numerous to be like the stars of the heavens. He has faith. And he goes. God calls him to be set apart. He calls him to the 
sign of circumcision. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or brought or bought with your money, from any foreigner who is not your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with money, surely I shall surely be circumcised. He trusted God through Egypt, through the going, through the promised land. He trusted God. There were times. Abraham struggled. There were times when it weren't simple, but in the end, he was faithful to God's promises, to God's call. His faith in God let him continue to believe. God continued to instruct Abraham how to live. He was faithful. The Lord provides him a son, a marriage. His son is a marriage. Abraham's old age. Then we read in Genesis 22. I'm going to read a, read a large section of Genesis 22. If you want to turn there, um, please do. Genesis 22, starting in verse 1. these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here, here I am. And he said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on the, on the mountain, which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, settled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. And I am going to go over there and worship and come again to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on. Isaac, his son, and he took his hand, uh, the fire, and the knife. So they went both together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself Lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. When they came to the place which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham reached out his hand, took the knife, and slaughtered him. The angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. Behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide, and said to this day, On the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Abraham here is a shining example. Of faith lived out in his life. The things he did, his willingness to follow God, to go where he did not know he was going. To be willing to sacrifice the child he loves, 
is the miracle of child because God acts. These things are not things that someone does who's merely going through the motions. It's not accidental choices. They're very purposeful. Someone who has faith. God is the man. Even many who you and I may consider faithful Christians even struggle when God calls them to a hard life. To a choice they do not like, to giving up something that they have been blessed with is difficult. Yet Abraham was faithful. The faithfulness has been remembered throughout generations. This faithfulness of Abraham. Abraham is referred to throughout the Old Testament and the New. In the Old Testament, God's people were proud to call themselves children of Abraham. It meant they were chosen. It meant they were children of the promise. They boasted in this. They boasted in who they were. They boasted in their father, Abraham. But their lives, so often, were not in line with his. Throughout much of the Old Testament, God blesses his people. He gives them more than they ever deserve. What do they do? They stiffen their necks. They, they don't worship him as they should. They cry out, how could God let this blank happen to me? They even take the worship that was due to God and give it this is what they've done. They claimed to be God's people. They claimed faith in Him. Yet when it came to their actions, they were required to hide that faith and reveal how bankrupt their faith really was. Abraham is not only mentioned in the Old Testament. He is spoken of throughout the New Testament as well. Paul tells us in Romans 9 of the pain he had for his kindred, uh, for his kinsmen, fellow Jews. How lost they are, but it's not as though the word of God has failed. Those promises that God made to the Jews, to the children of Abraham, it is not as if those promises have failed. God is still faithful and just to his promises. Paul tells us, but it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all those who are descendants of Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham, because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not his children of the flesh who are the children of God, the children of the promise are counted as offspring. We hear of Abraham time and time again in the New Testament. Again, Paul, Galatians 3 tells us, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed, so that those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. There are many promises the scripture gives us to Abraham and his descendants. Simply being born of Abraham was not enough. Having uh, just paying lip service was not enough. Abraham showed us a life of faith that is lived out in his choices, in what he did in his life. That is what we are called to as well. Another one of the many places Abraham is mentioned in the New Testament 
Because what the author of Hebrews says, Hebrews 11, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place that he was to receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of the promise as in a foreign land. Living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that had foundation, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah received the power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she is considered as faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him, Good as dead, was born descendants, as many as the stars of the heaven, as, innum as innumerable as grains of sand by the seashore. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place. It was by faith that he acted. This is the faith that James is calling us. Faith without works is dead. What good is it a faith that is not put into action? We are called to faith by the example of Abraham. It was by faith he did these things. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Paul began in 1 Thessalonians first by introducing himself, and then he says these words. We give thanks to God always for you, constantly uh, mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your works of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness. This was the faith that Abraham lived out. His work of faith. His faith was counted him as righteousness. And that faith was displayed as being faithful to God's calling. Abraham would not always have understood why God was calling him to do certain things. But he remained faithful nonetheless. He went when God called. He did as God instructed. His life was a testament to his faith. And that is what we are called to do. James is telling us that we cannot have true faith as Paul says here, except with works of faith, and labor of love, and a steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus. James began our text this morning. If you go back to that first slide. He began our verse 20. He said, Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Do you want to be shown, you foolish person? He calls his opponents fools. Those Jews who of the Old Testament who would pride themselves in being children of Abraham, yet they denied God in their actions. Were they not fools? Did they not fool themselves? The person who believes, I can have faith apart from works, and I am sure that's good enough. A foolish person. Do not fool yourself into thinking you are safe. You are called to faith. We are saved by grace through faith. It is not a result of works, but that faith will pour itself out through your life and what you do. Do not fool yourself into thinking you are safe if your life. No evidence of your faith. Live a life 
for Christ. Turn to him for your salvation. Live a life in light of your faith. Live for Christ and only trust in him. Let's pray. Jesus, we pray for this time. Pray that we remember the example of Abraham. How he lived. He was not his actions that saved him, it was the faith he had. But that faith was revealed through what he did. Let us live a life that trusts you. Even when we do not understand what it is you are calling us to, we trust and love you above all. Let us be faithful to what you call us to. We ask and trust you alone for our salvation. Let's stand as we offer our invitation. Only in trust. Join together and sing our benediction chorus. Bind us together.